Hi, my name is Ryan D'Souza and I'm a graduate student at the University of South Carolina with the Signal Integrity Group. Today I will be demonstrating how we can use a vector network analyzer to conduct measurements on a test board. Let us first take a look at exactly what is a vector network analyzer, how does it work, and the need and importance of calibration. Network analyzers test circuit devices, components, sub-assemblies, and systems. Many components are used as building blocks in more complicated RF systems. For example, in most trans receivers, there are filters to remove signal harmonics and set the intermediate frequency bandwidth. Individual devices in a communication system must not cause excessive signal distortion. The network analyzer can pretest a device for a linear delay distortion over its frequency range. Devices can be screened for magnitude response and linear phase shift performance before they are installed in the system, saving further testing, troubleshooting, and rework costs. The network analyzer can also test for certain types of non-linear device performance, such as testing the signal compression in a power amplifier before installation. If not pre-tested, the amplifier could generate unwanted signals within the RF system's transmission bandwidth. A common use for a network analyzer is to assure that a device provides good impedance match with the neighboring devices, thus providing optimum power transfer. In the frequency domain, we only talk about sine waves of a particular frequency and the transmitted and reflected waves scattered off the DUT are also of the same frequency. A network analyzer analyzes a circuit or the device on the test by comparing the signal that is applied to the circuit that is the incident signal, also called as a reference signal, with a signal that goes through or is reflected from the circuit. The network analyzer needs to control the reference signal to provide an accurate comparison. As mentioned, a device is tested by stimulating it with a signal and looking how it responds. The network analyzer provides the incident signal. If the source is inside the analyzer, a portion of the signal is used as a reference for ratio measurements. The receiver called the R receiver, R for reference, provides a continuous accurate measure of the incident signal. The reflected wave is measured with the A receiver and the transmitted wave is measured with the B receiver. With amplitude and phase information of these four waves, we can quantify the reflection and transmission characteristics of our DUT. Unlike TDR, the reflected wave is measured separately from the incident wave. Network analysis characterizes the behavior of the device using an accurate measurement of the ratios of the reflected signal to the incident signal, which is called as the return loss, and the transmitted signal to the incident signal, which is called as the insertion loss. A CW signal, that is, a continuous wave or sinusoidal signal, is fully characterized when its amplitude and phase are known. In fact, all the network analyzer does is measure the amplitude and phase of the reflected and transmitted signals relative to the incident signal. Measurement parameters such as gain and loss, transmission coefficients, as parameters like S21 and S12, insertion phase and group delay come under the transmission measurements whereas return loss, SWR, reflection coefficients as parameters like S11 and S22 and impedance Z fall under the reflection measurements. An ideal vector network analyzer setup would have perfectly matched ports, ideal calibration standards, ideal connectors and probes, zero crosstalk between ports, no variation in cables and will have a stable environment. However, practically speaking, there are always some kinds of errors that develop while conducting measurements. There are three different types of measurement errors, systematic errors, random errors, and drift errors. Systematic errors are repeatable and are assumed to be time invariant. They can be characterized during the calibration process and mathematically reduced during measurements. They are never completely removed though. There are always some residual errors due to limitations in the calibration process. The residual systematic errors result from imperfections in the calibration standards connector interface, interconnecting cables, and instrumentation. Random errors are caused by instrument noise, that is, IF noise floor and repeatability. Random errors vary randomly with respect to time. The noise errors can be reduced by increasing the source power, narrowing the IF bandwidth, and using trace averaging over multiple sweeps. Drift errors are due to instrument or test system performance changing after a calibration has been done. Drift errors are primarily caused by thermal expansion characteristics of interconnecting cables within the test setup and conversion stability of the microwave frequency converter and can be removed by recalibrating. 
Calibration removes one or more of the systematic errors using an equation called an error model. Measurement of high quality standards, for example a short, open, load and through, allows the analyzer to solve for error terms in the error model. The accuracy of the calibrated measurements is dependent on the quality of the standards in the calibration kit and how accurately the standards are modeled in the calibration kit definition file. The calibration kit definition file is stored in the analyzer. In order to make accurate measurements, the calibration kit definition file must match the actual calibration kit used. Generally, you should calibrate for making a measurement under the following circumstances. You want the best accuracy possible. You are adapting to a different connector type or impedance. You are connecting a cable between the test device and an analyzer test port. You are measuring across a wide frequency span or an electrically long device. Or you are connecting an attenuator to other such device on the input or output of the test device. If your test setup meets any of the conditions above, system characteristics such as amplitude at the device input, frequency response, accuracy, directivity, crosstalk, source match and load match may be affected. For the uncorrected calibration, though it's convenient, generally no errors are removed. The response calibration is easy to perform. It's used when highest accuracy is not required. The calibration removes frequency response errors. The one port calibration is done for reflection measurements. It requires good termination for high accuracy with two port devices. The one port calibration removes errors like directivity, source match and reflection tracking. When the highest accuracy is needed, a full two port calibration is done. The full two port calibration removes errors like directivity, source and load match, reflection tracking, transmission tracking and crosstalk. We will now do a full two port calibration. We first need to connect and wear the grounding strap on our wrist. We then preset the VNA by pressing the preset button which is under the instrument state block. The calibration kit we are using here is 850-52D Agilent calibration kit. We now select the calibration kit file in our analyzer. For that we will have to select Cal CalKit, select CalKit and select 3.5 MMD 850-52 which is our calibration kit. Once we have selected the calibration file which corresponds to the calibration kit we are using, we go ahead with the full two port calibration. For this we will have to connect the two cables at ports 1 and port 2. We then select Cal, Calibrate Menu, Full to Port. For the forward measurement, we use the cable that is connected at port 1. First, we connect the open standard to the cable at port 1. Remember not to rotate the standard, but only rotate the SMA connector of the cable. After connecting the open standard to the cable, we then select open. The line below open suggests that the open measurement has been completed. Next we connect the short standard to the cable at port 1 and select short. Next we connect the load standard to the cable at port 1 and select loads. Now here, since the load we are using is a broadband load, we select broadband. Once this is done, we select done loads. Now for the reverse measurements, we connect the cable at port 2 and connect the open standard to a cable and select open. We then connect the short load to the cable at port 2 and select short. We then connect the load standard to the port 2 select load, select broadband, done loads. For the transmission measurements, 
We connect the through between the ports 1 and 2. We then select transmission, do both forward and reverse. Since we are omitting the isolation part, we select isolation, omit isolation, done to port calibration. It then asks us to save the calibration data. For that, we select Save Recall, select a register, and Save State. Return loss was measured before and after a one-port calibration. We see the importance of calibration in order to acquire error-free results. And hence, calibration is a mandatory step while doing measurements using a vector network analyzer. Now since we are done with the calibration, we go ahead with measuring our board. The board that we will be using has a couple of micro strips and strip lines. For this experiment, we will be using the 7700 mil strip line. Now that we have connected our board to the two ports, we now select measure. And by selecting S11, S21, S12 and S22, we can analyze these par S parameters. We can also analyze these S parameters on other formats such as, for example, a Smith chart. For that, we'll have to select the Format button and Smith chart. S11 is our return loss. We can adjust the scaling by setting a start and stop frequency as well. Say, for example, we have to set a frequency range of 50 megahertz to 1 gigahertz. For this, we select start, enter 50 megahertz, then we select stop, enter 1 gigahertz. Let's now go ahead and save our plot on a floppy disk. The plot image is saved as a JPEG file. To save a plot, we select the save recall button. We then select the save file format. Make sure that the file type is selected as graphic type and we then select save file. The analyzer generates a JPEG file which is then stored in the floppy disk. Keep connectors clean. Protect connectors with plastic end caps. Keep connector temperature same as the analyzers. Clean surfaces first with clean, dry, compressed air. Use lint-free swab or brush. Rotate only the connector nut. Do not cross-thread the connection. Do not twist connector body to make connections. Do not mate different connector types. We usually think of impedance as being the ratio of voltage to the current. While this is in fact the basic definition of impedance, it can also be defined in terms of how waves interact with the device. If a signal propagates from a region with impedance Z1 and hits a region with impedance Z2, the incident waveform will reflect. The reflection coefficient defined as the ratio of the reflector to the incident voltage is related to the two impedances by Z2 minus Z1 by Z2 plus Z1. By measuring the reflected signal and knowing the incident signal and the impedance of the source, the impedance of the second structure, typically the device and the test, can be extracted. When the measurement is done in the frequency domain by VNA, the incident waveform is a sine wave and the reflected amplitude and phase is measured at each frequency value. The reflection coefficient, usually referred to as a scattering parameter or S parameter and specifically S11, is related to the total integrated overall impedance of the DUT at each frequency by this equation shown. When we have a two-port DUT, such as a connector pin or a transmission line in a backplane, S11 is the reflected signal and S21 is the transmitted signal. When we measure the two port S parameters, we are connecting a 50 ohm load to each port. The sine wave that goes into the DUT will see a 50 ohm load on the far end. What reflects back to us is related to the impedance mismatch of the DUT at the two ends where there is a 50 ohm load. The closer the DUT is to 50 ohms across the entire frequency range, the less reflected signal and the smaller the magnitude of S11. We call